this morning, um, as I mentioned before, we want to look at something in the morning that dovetails with what we're looking at this evening. Um, as we look at each of these characters, they, they all have certain things in common. One thing they had in common is they were all devoted to Jesus Christ, and, and that's, of course, what the Lord calls us to be as well. But each of them also has something that they're famous for, something that kind of jumps out from their lives. You know, with Knox, certainly it was his courage, and with Bunyan, um, he was an expert in spiritual warfare, as we saw last week. I think with John Newton, it's the idea that God saves even the greatest of sinners. Uh, he considered himself to be a wretch, as he tells us in Amazing Grace, saved a wretch like me. Uh, if we don't see ourselves as wretches, we really don't understand what we were like outside of Christ. We need to see, be able to say the same thing about ourselves. But certainly, that is the way that Paul viewed himself. Uh, even in his first letter um, to Timothy, uh, while he was, I believe, in prison, but certainly after after he had been serving the Lord for a while and had grown in grace, he still looked at himself as the greatest of sinners. And yet, the Lord had mercy on him. Yet, the Lord saved him. So I want us to be encouraged by this this morning that it doesn't matter how great a sinner we may be. If we trust in Jesus, he will forgive us. He will cleanse us. He will wash us. He will provide for us a place in heaven. Let me begin by reading 1 Timothy. Uh, I'll, I think, uh, uh, well, I'd like to begin from the beginning of the uh, chapter and read through verse 16, but we're going to be looking specifically at verses 12 through 16. This is what Paul writes to Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men strain from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me is the foremost. Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, we've looked so far in our series at uh, the lives of <clears throat> John Knox, uh, the reformer of Scotland, and John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. And we've seen that both of these men provide us with examples of differing things, certainly examples of devotion. Both of these men committed themselves to doing what they believed would honor their lords. You know, I, Knox wanted to bring... 
the gospel to Scotland. He wanted them to have the freedom to worship in freedom. Uh, John Bunyan from, from that jail which he was in prison for 12 years wrote a book on spiritual warfare and how one might escape, as it were, the dungeon of despair through the key of, of promise. Both of these men were devoted to that task. Both of them also gave us examples of courage. John Knox was willing to speak the truth before the nobility who had put men to death for saying the very things that he was saying earlier. As a matter of fact, the man who converted him was, was put to death. He was a martyr for the faith. And yet John Knox was willing to do that even before Mary. Okay, John Bunyan was willing to do the same thing. He preached the gospel knowing in advance that, and even being warned in advance, that if he preached the gospel in that particular place, he would very likely be arrested. And he was arrested and he spent 12 years in jail. He could have avoided that. But instead he chose to do his duty. He was a man of courage. And I believe both of these men were examples to us in these two areas of devotion and courage because they were both willing to take up the spiritual weapons of their warfare. They fought against the world, they fought against their flesh, they fought against the devil and by his grace they won. They won the battle. If you can't win against these three, they will keep you from doing anything meaningful for the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are to have their level of devotion, if we are to have their level of courage, we have to be willing to fight. We have to know that there is a battle that we're in. But we have to be willing to fight. We have to be willing to fight with the same kind of endurance. You know, not just a few skirmishes here and there, but a constant battle. And we also have to have the same willingness to suffer. And we'll, we'll never do that unless we can overcome those enemies because they will keep us from desiring to do what the Lord calls us to do because of the suffering that's involved. Now today we're going to consider another example of one who was wholly devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and that is John Newton. Uh, John Newton of course is the one who is best remembered as being the author of Amazing Grace, a hymn that exalts the mercy of God in sinners. And of course he could write from uh, about this because he was writing from his own experience. Now I want us to consider this morning how it is that Newton was able to write this hymn. Remembering that this hymn isn't merely about what the Lord has done for us or what he is willing to do for anyone who is willing to put their hope and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this hymn is actually about what the Lord did for Newton himself. How God saved him when he was a wretch. Now, as we'll see this evening, he was able to write this hymn because he experienced God's love and his mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I want us to see from this as well is that uh, John Newton's life actually shows us the motive, uh, it provides us with the motive as to why we should devote ourselves to the Lord. Uh, we, we talked about how one can be devoted and how one can have courage. We need to engage in spiritual warfare. But it's as we engage in warfare that we grow in love to the Lord, which is what allows us to be willing to suffer and to engage the enemy and do what it is the Lord actually calls us to do. But here's another way that we can grow in love to the Lord, and that is by looking again at what it is the Lord has done for us and to see who He is. We can devote ourselves to the Lord because God is a gracious God who delights to show mercy even to the worst of sinners and He has shown mercy to us. Jonathan Edwards once said, and this is something we need to realize is true, we're going to see that this morning, it doesn't matter how great a sinner you are, God can greatly Glorify His grace through your salvation. God is willing to save even to the uttermost anyone who will come to Him through Jesus Christ. Now that is what Paul tells Timothy this morning. Now as we look at uh, what Paul says here, I think first of all we can apply to ourselves this idea that we can thank the Lord that He has called us into His kingdom and that he is willing to use us in his kingdom. Because that is what Paul begins 
uh, by saying in verse 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Now this is the kind of perspective that, that we need to have, the same perspective that the Apostle Paul had as far as he was concerned. There was no greater blessing than being in God's kingdom through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was no greater privilege in that kingdom than being used by God to advance that kingdom. Now why, why would he believe that? Well obviously because being in God's kingdom meant that he was safe from the consequences of his sins and being used in God's kingdom meant not only that he was doing what the Lord called him to do and was bringing honor to him, but also that he was storing up riches in heaven. Now Paul basically reduced all of life to the bare essentials, the things that really matter. And really there is nothing else but this that really matters, being in God's kingdom and using our time on earth to store up treasures in heaven. Because remember the things that we gain of this world, Jesus reminds us again and again, are only for this world. When we die, Everything that we've accumulated in this world has to be left behind. It's going to be given to someone else. We only get to keep the things that we do for the Lord. And that's why Paul was thankful that the Lord had called him, considered him faithful, put him into service. Jonathan Edwards once wrote in a sermon on Luke 6:24. And I've quoted this a couple of times, but listen to this because this, this is so important. He says, this life is so short and so inconsiderable that it is no matter who prospers here and who does not. The only thing worth considering is who it is who prospers in an eternal state. I don't know how often you think about that, but that's something you should think about and I should think about every single day. This life is so short and inconsiderable. I mean, for him, it was, you know, 30 years was pretty much the, the, the limit. He lived to be 55. There were some people who lived to be, you know, in, into their 80s. But what is that compared to endless stretches of time that come after that? What does it matter if you prosper or don't prosper in this short little, uh, you know, amount of time that basically James says is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away compared to, again, eternity? What really matters is what's going to happen there and what our condition of life is going to be there, who it is that prospers there, not here. Well, how can we prosper there? Well, the way to prosper forever there, of course, is to serve the Lord here and to use what He gives us here to serve Him. When, when the ten disciples on one occasion were upset with James and John because they put their mother up to asking Jesus for the two greatest seats in his kingdom, they wanted the seats of greatest honor, Jesus went on to tell them how it is they could actually obtain those seats, what they needed to do. And this is what he said in Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now you want to prosper in the eternal state? This is what Jesus says we must do. We must humble ourselves. The more we humble ourselves here, the more greatly the Lord will exalt us there. The lower we stoop, the higher he is going to lift us and of course, Jesus showed us by his own life that that was true. He just told us that he did not come to, to uh, be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And of course, the Apostle Paul writing about that very thing tells us in Philippians 2 verses 6 through 9. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, God taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, 
Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Why is it that Jesus is exalted to the position that he is in heaven? We often think it's because of who he is, because he is the Son of God in human flesh. But that isn't the only reason. The reason why he was so highly exalted was because he so greatly humbled himself by becoming a man and becoming a servant as a man and then humbling himself to that, well, to, to die the, well, the, uh, the, the kind of death which would be considered the most cursed. Cursed is the one who is hung on a tree. He became a curse for us, and because he was willing to humble himself even to the point of death and even the death on a cross, God highly exalted him. You see, this is true in Jesus' life, and it's true in our life. The way to prosper there is to be a servant here, and the more you humble yourself and serve here, the more you will be exalted there. So the, the, the goal of life here is not to exalt ourselves and to get everybody else to look at us and to honor us and to get everything that the world has to offer or even to gain honor from one another here, but rather to give honor and to serve one another. So Paul was first of all thankful that the Lord considered him faithful and made him a servant. Now, a second question is, how can we serve him better? than we are now. Well, first of all, of course, we need to humble ourselves, but secondly, we must be willing faithfully to do whatever it is the Lord gives us to do, whether large or small. And the Lord usually starts us off with something small to see if we're going to be faithful with that before he gives to us a greater responsibility. Jesus said in Luke 16, 10, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. But he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. We have to show ourselves to be faithful with small things before the Lord will give us larger things. Well, Paul was faithful in the small things. Now, we may think that he began as an apostle and he began as a missionary, but it isn't altogether the case. God gave him smaller things before he gave him larger things. His own testimony tells us he didn't immediately go to the mission field. Sometimes it seems like he, well, he, he did immediately begin to engage in proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ, but he also went away for a while. He also did smaller projects, but he was faithful with the things that the Lord gave him to do, and as he was, the Lord gave him more to do. He gave him more responsibility, and he gave him more strength so he could faithfully do what the Lord called him to do. I want you to notice again what he writes in verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Well, Paul was faithful with the smaller things and then the Lord strengthened him to do greater things and gave him more opportunities to serve. If we are faithful with what the Lord has entrusted us to do, he will also give us more. And let's not forget that whatever the Lord gives us to do in his kingdom, is a privilege, it's an honor, whether it's a, a large thing or a small thing, because it is a blessing just to serve him, just to be a part of his kingdom, to be in his kingdom and to be able to serve him at all is a tremendous blessing. The psalmist writes something very similar to this in Psalm 84 verse 12, and when you look at the author of this psalm, I believe he was a Levite, the Levites were, were also those charged with writing hymns and, and psalms to be sung in the temple worship, but this is one of, the, one of the ideas, one of the sentiments that one of the authors wrote. He says this, for a day in your courts, at, and this would be in the courts of the tabernacle, I believe, of the Lord, is better than a thousand outside. And they, they served continually in the tabernacle. One day here is better than a thousand out there. And then he goes, I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God, then dwell in the tents of wickedness. The threshold, of course, is the, is the entry into the tent. And he's saying, I would rather stand at the, at the opening. And the people who would stand at the opening were those who were guarding the tabernacle. And it was the most menial position 
within the tabernacle itself. He says, I would rather have the most menial position in the tabernacle of God than dwell in the tents, go fully into the tents of the wicked. So just to be in God's kingdom, to be a part of that kingdom, to have even the most menial task in the kingdom of heaven is better than anything the world has to offer. Having the lowest position in God's kingdom is better than to have the highest position in the kingdom of darkness. So it is a privilege, it is an honor to be in the kingdom and to be given that blessing of, of service. Now another way that we can serve him better is to stir ourselves up to thankfulness and at the same time humble ourselves even more. And the way Paul did this was simply to remember what he was before the Lord actually saved him. And by the way, we'll see the same thing this evening, that this is what humbled Newton. This is what motivated Newton to devote himself even more fully to the Lord. And I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say the same thing was true of Knox, the same thing was true of Bunyan, the same thing is true of Spurgeon, and anybody else who has ever served the Lord. Paul writes in verse 13. He first of all thanks the Lord that he considered him faithful, putting him into service, and he says this in verse 13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Now Paul, like those we've considered in our Reformation series thus far, had a past, and Paul's past was not a pretty one. I think if, if any one of us would have known Paul before his conversion, as we read about him in the Bible, we might suspect there is the last person in the world that the Lord would ever save and would ever make a servant in his kingdom. And why would we say that? Well, because of what Paul says about himself here. Paul, Paul was a blasphemer. The word blasphemy doesn't always apply to God. What it means is to insult or to slander someone. It certainly can apply to God. And who was it that Paul actually slandered? Was it God? No, well, it was yes and no. Being a Pharisee, he would never have blasphemed the name of God. And yet, that's exactly what he did when he spoke against Jesus. He was blaspheming God. Paul says in his testimony before King Agrippa and Festus in Acts 26, verse 9, So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. See, that's what he was like. He was a blasphemer before he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that condition, Paul was not content to blaspheme Jesus himself, he tried to compel those who followed Jesus to do exactly the same thing. Paul was a blasphemer. Paul says he was a persecutor of the church. Well, we know that's true. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Now Saul, that is Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the apostle Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus or at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And why did he want to bring them there? Because if he couldn't get them to turn and blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ, he wanted to put them to death. He was a persecutor of the church, and of course it's hard to distinguish that from what comes next. He was a violent aggressor. He wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 1.13, for you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. He hated Jesus. But Jesus was out of his reach. As far as Paul was concerned, Jesus was, was dead. So since he couldn't hurt Jesus, he tried to destroy those who actually confessed and loved Jesus. He went after his people. Now, with a past like this, we might wonder why the Lord didn't just simply strike Paul down with a bolt of lightning from heaven. I mean, on one occasion, he, he did strike Ananias and Sapphira down because they lied to the Spirit. On another occasion, he struck Herod with worms, and he suffered for a few days before he was finally consumed from within by those worms. And what did Herod do? Well, Herod persecuted the church. He killed James, the brother of John. He arrested Peter. 
Uh, he took the credit for a speech that he made before the people, and they were crying out, saying, oh, the voice of, of a God and not of a man, and that's when the angel of the Lord struck him down. God does strike people down for their sins. We need to recognize that. He was the one who did that in both cases. And as a matter of fact, Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 1 that his wrath is being revealed from heaven every single day against those that are taking the knowledge of God and tearing it down and doing wickedness in the sight of God. But the point here is that Paul persecuted his church. He was a blasphemer, a violent aggressor. He tried to destroy the church, and yet God didn't strike him down. Although Paul knew he deserved to be struck down by the Lord, but instead the Lord showed him mercy. Now, why did the Lord show him mercy? And he didn't show mercy to these others, although we can't say he didn't show them any mercy, but the mercy of not striking him down, okay? And he did show mercy to these others by not striking them down until later in their lives. Now, does Paul mean, he, well, basically he tells us in Romans, excuse me, in, in 1 Timothy 1, verse 13, he says, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Now that's going to take a little bit of explanation. Does Paul mean to say here that his ignorance was an excuse for his sin? Is he saying here that God is bound to show mercy to everyone who sins but they don't know that they're sinning? No, that's not what he's saying because we need to remember no one deserves the mercy of God whether they know they're doing wrong or not doing wrong. God reserves the right to show mercy to whomever he wants and to withhold it from whomever he wants. Romans 11, verse 18, Paul writes this, So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. If God wants to, he can show mercy to somebody who knowingly breaks his commandments, and he cannot show mercy to someone who breaks them without knowing. There's a lot of people who die in this world who have never really known the full revelation of God's will, uh, and they still are judged for their sins. God doesn't show mercy on them. And there's people, of course, who perish under a tremendous amount of light. So Paul's not saying that God excused him on the basis of his ignorance. What is he actually saying? Well, he's saying that though it's true that God sovereignly shows mercy to whom he wills, He's, it's also true that what we know or don't know about God's will still makes a difference to God. It does. It still makes a difference. The more we know, the more culpable we are for our sins. Jesus said on one occasion in Matthew 11, verses 23 through 24, And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would remain to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Well, we might have thought that Sodom would be judged more severely than Capernaum uh, because of the wickedness that Sodom committed. I mean, just look in the Old Testament and see what it is they did. But the Lord tells us it will be Capernaum that will suffer more in the day of judgment because they sinned against greater light and against greater knowledge. Jesus said if the miracles had occurred in Sodom that occurred in you, they would have repented. You had the privilege of this light. More knowledge equals greater responsibility and greater culpability. Well, now we get back to the Apostle Paul. What about him? Didn't he have knowledge? I mean, he was a Pharisee. He was somebody who was schooled in the Old Testament law. He knew more about it than, than we know about it, even when he was unconverted. Because of Paul's background, he certainly had more knowledge than most people, but yet there was still a sense in which he was ignorant. He didn't realize Jesus was the Christ. That's quite clear. He thought he was serving God when he was trying to destroy the church. You know, well, intent, well you know, good intentions, but um, the wrong execution. Now, this does not excuse his sin, but it does provide extenuating circumstances. He did not commit the unpardonable sin, as some of his fellow Pharisees had done when they accused Jesus of being in league with the devil. Remember, he casts out demons by 
the ruler of, of the demons. And Jesus said, you speak against the Spirit. There is no forgiveness for that. Paul had not excluded himself from God's kingdom as those other Pharisees had done. He was still capable of mercy and that is what the Lord showed him purely out of his mercy and his grace, out of his good pleasure. It wasn't because Paul deserved it and it wasn't merely because he was ignorant of who Jesus was. God could have just as easily struck him down. But Paul says there were still some mitigating circumstances. I could have committed the unpardonable sin, but I didn't. I was still capable of mercy, and the Lord showed me mercy. The Lord gave Paul that faith that works through love, and Paul trusted Jesus, and he was saved. He writes in verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which were found in Christ Jesus. More than abundant to change his heart, to give him the grace he needed to trust in Jesus, to apply Jesus to himself, to have all of his sins washed away, and to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. But again, Paul did not deserve this. It was purely of his grace. And that humbled Paul. And it stirred him up to even greater thankfulness so that he served his Lord with greater zeal and a greater willingness to suffer for the one who suffered for him. Now the best way that we can humble ourselves so that we can serve better and so that we can be more thankful and have that motivation so that we will be moved to devote ourselves more to the service of God is to remember what we were before the Lord saved us. Now we may not have been as bad as, as Paul or maybe we were worse than Paul. But either way, there's plenty of room in all of our lives, whatever our condition may have been, to thank God for His mercy because every single one of us had done enough to condemn our souls forever to hell. The Lord did not have to save us, but He did. And that should move us to give ourselves more to His service, as it did Paul, as it did Bunyan, as it did Newton, as it did Augustine and others. Now finally, why does God do this? Why does he even save sinners? And why would he save somebody as deep in sin as Paul? Why would he save us? And here's Paul's main point. It was that he might glorify, that he might draw attention to his mercy and his grace and his patience so that others would look at us and look at Paul as examples and say, you know what, if God could save him, there must be hope for me too. Paul writes in Romans 15 and 6, excuse me, I keep saying Romans, in 1 Timothy 1, in verses 15 and 16, it is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me is the foremost. Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now notice here first of all that Paul did not excuse his sin for his ignorance. He doesn't say, well I didn't know what I was doing, therefore I'm not the greatest of sinners. I knew what I was doing. You know, there's a certain sense in which he did know what he was doing. He didn't fully know what he was doing, but there were certain things he did know. And he didn't excuse himself. He says, I am the greatest of sinners. I am the worst of sinners. He blasphemed God. He persecuted his people. He tried to destroy them. That was in the past. But notice that Paul here is using the present tense. And it's many years since that's happened and since he's been forgiven. And he's grown a lot but yet he still uses the present tense and he says, I am foremost of all. He still looked at himself as the greatest sinner even after all these years. But that is why the Lord showed him mercy because he was the greatest of sinners. He wanted to use Paul as an example to those who might think they were too bad, that they had sinned too much for the Lord ever to save them. And again, I would just ask you to remember the, the documentaries we've been looking at through this series. Think about what Bunyan was like before he came to faith in Christ. Remember the woman in the village who had the filthy mouth, reproved him for, for his profanity? <laughs> and he said, well, this, this woman is reproving me. I must really have a dirty mouth. Well, we're going to see 
The same thing in, in Newton. He was an evil man, a wicked man. We all were before we came to Christ. Uh, we almost watched the, uh, the documentary on Augustine, and if we had, we'd seen Augustine struggle with exactly the same thing. He had a filthy mouth. He was a thief. He had a concubine. He was involved in all kinds of things that were immoral. But that's true again of everyone whom the Lord saves. Why does the Lord save men like this who live publicly such wicked lives? It's because he wants to show the world that he is willing to save even the greatest of sinners if they will only come to him through his son. Jesus said to the Pharisees when they asked his disciples, why is it that your master is eating with tax gatherers and harlots? Jesus replied in Matthew 9, verses 12 and 13. It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus did not come for those who think that they're good enough. He came for those who know that they are sinners. He's shown that he's willing to save even the very worst of sinners if they're willing to acknowledge their sin and come to him. Now what this means is he's willing to save any one of you here this morning who don't know him. All you need to do is simply trust him to save you. Now that, that means more, of course, than just believing that Jesus is a savior and that he's able to save and, and that he is willing to save. What it means is you must actually trust him to save you. You have to be willing to turn from your sins. You have to be willing to look to him in faith. I mean, there's no place you can go in the world where he's standing and say, come and shake my hand and I'll save you or come into my presence and I'll save you, he's in heaven. So you have to look to him by faith. You have to believe that he's there and that he does extend his hand toward you and that he is willing to save you if you will only take him up on his offer and receive him as your savior and at the same time, of course, receive him as your Lord. If that's what you want, that's what you want him to do, then you're not too far gone. You haven't committed the unpardonable sin. If you want to come to him, he says, come. And he says, I will receive you. And I will not turn you away. Jesus said, everyone who comes to me, I would never turn him away. Because he wants you to come. Now, if you do know him this morning, you know the Lord has done for you what he did for Paul, what he did for Augustine, what he did for Bunyan and what he did for Newton. He saved you from your sins. He saved you from those things that would have condemned you forever. And he wants you to remember that and let that stir you up to thankfulness. Because if we saw ourselves the way we should see ourselves, we should say with the Apostle Paul, I'm the foremost of all. I'm the greatest of sinners. I'm a worse sinner than the Apostle Paul. And yet the Lord had mercy on me so that he might show others that they too can be saved. Well, that's exactly what the table reminds us of this morning, is that Jesus was willing to go to these lengths to lay down his life, to shed his blood, in order to save the greatest of sinners. That is the extent of his love. And he wants us to remember that. And that's what we need to be meditating on as we come to the table. Now again, this table is only for those of us who have trusted Jesus and have turned from our sins and have received that mercy and that grace, not for those of us who were still in our sins. The table is for those who show that they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ by repenting of all their sins, not just some. And really, if, if we don't have, if we're not seeking after a devotion to the Lord, like Paul, like Augustine, like Bunyan, like Newton, like our Lord calls us to, like Lord, our Lord Jesus himself. If we're not seeking after that kind of devotion to him, well, then we have sins that we need to repent of as we come to the table because that's what our Lord calls us to do. He says, follow me. And when he says, follow me, what he means is follow my example. Jesus is not walking down Stanford Avenue right now and we can't just fall in line behind him. 
He's in heaven. We need to follow his example. We need to follow his word. We need to become as, as he calls us to become. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Turn from our sins and become like him. And wherever we're falling short of that, that is the sin we need to repent of before we come uh, to the table. Now, I'm not saying we have to become perfect before we come to the table. We just have to repent of those sins that are holding us back. And we can do that right now as we bow before the Lord and call upon Him because every sin we're willing to, to confess, He's willing to forgive and He will forgive. He is forgiving all of our sins if we're trusting in Him. It's just the, re, the repentance and the confessing of the sins is the evidence that we are actually trusting in Him. So let's spend just a few moments now in prayer and let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to His table.